We have looked at Newton's first and second laws of motion. In this video, we're going to consider Newton's third law of motion. Looking at Newton's third law of motion, which is sometimes called the law of action and reaction, it says, whenever one object exerts a force on a second object, the second object exerts an equal and opposite force on the first. Sometimes you hear that said as for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Um, that's kind of an old timey way of stating it. The word action in that context actually means force. So you could say for every force, there's an equal and opposite reaction force. That's the basic idea. And it's as simple as the example listed here in the slide. When you press your hand against the wall, the wall pushes back against your hand. The hand and wall press on each other with equal and opposite forces. It's that simple. Now in this slide, we're going to look at some details to clarify Newton's third law of motion, and specifically those two forces, the action force and the reaction force. Um, the force that's pushing is called the action force, and the force that's pushing back is called the reaction force. And they are co-pairs of a single interaction, so they always work together. You can't have one without the other. They are equal in strength and opposite in direction, and they always act on different objects. And that's going to be a key idea for us. They always act on different objects. And so we have here a slide showing some different action and reaction pairs. Um, a car uh, is driving along the road. What's pushing the car along the road? It's the tire and the friction of the tire with the pavement. As the tire rotates, it pushes the car forward. And so you have the action of the tire pushing on the road and the reaction of the road pushing on the tire. That's the action-reaction pair. For a rocket ship, it's burning fuel. It's sending fuel out. The uh, action is the rocket pushes on the gas. The, the action is the rocket pushes on the gas. The reaction is that the gas pushes on the rocket. Um, here we have a picture of a person pulling on a rope. The action, or actually that's a spring. The action is a man pulling on a spring. The reaction is the spring pulling on the man. And all of those forces are equal and opposite. Now here's one that's a little bit surprising, but it has to be true. If you drop a ball, why does a ball fall? The ball falls because gravity. The earth is pulling the ball down. At the same time, the ball is pulling the earth up. So why doesn't the earth leap up to the ball? The answer can be seen in Newton's second law because the forces are the same, but the mass of the earth is way bigger than the mass of the ball, so the acceleration is way smaller. So small, you can't really even see it. So here's another situation we can ponder. It says, a high-speed bus collides head-on with an innocent bug, you know, like a bee or something. The force of the impact splatters the unfortunate bug all over the windshield. In this collision, the bug hitting the bus, which item, the bug or the bus, gets a bigger force? Which of those two things, the bug or the bus, gets the bigger force? What do you think? Most people, if they don't already know the answer and they're just kind of guessing, it feels like the answer should be the bug, that the bug gets the bigger force, but it turns out that's not true. The answer is that both the bug and the bus get the same amount of force? It's a trick question because Newton's third law tells us the bug is pushing against the windshield. The windshield has to push back against the bug with an equal and opposite force. So if the forces are the same, why does the bug go splatter and the bus doesn't even hardly notice the bug? Again, it all it's all about the acceleration. The acceleration is equal to the force over the mass. The bus has such a big mass, its acceleration is tiny. It's so tiny the bus doesn't even notice. The bug, on the other hand, has a very small mass. So you're dividing by a small number, that makes the acceleration very, very big. And it's so much acceleration that it literally splatters the bug. So here's a fun thing to think about, and it's something that a lot of people get confused about when they first learn about Newton's third law of motion. 
I've got a picture here of a horse pulling a cart and the force of the horse pulling on the cart is going to pull the cart this way. And I'll call that the force of the horse on the cart. But we know from Newton's third law that there's going to be an equal and opposite force of the cart pulling on the horse. And I'll call that C slash H. So in my notation here, this force, the horse on the cart, the slash means on, and here this is the force of the cart on the horse. And we know from Newton's third law that these should be equal and opposite. But we've said previously that equal and opposite forces cancel to give you no net force. So how is it possible for the horse to pull on the cart if the forces are canceling? Well, obviously they can't be canceling because we know that horses can pull carts, right? So how does that make sense? Well, here's the idea. This force is the horse on the cart. This one is the cart on the horse. This one is on the cart. This one is on the horse. This force is acting on the cart. This force is acting on the horse. Are you getting it? The forces are equal and opposite, but they're acting on different things. And so, if I want to know, is the cart going to move, I only want to consider the forces on the cart. This force is not acting on the cart. What's it acting on? It's acting on the horse. And so, if you're considering just the cart by itself, it's got the force of the horse pulling on it, Maybe there's some friction or something else, but only look at the forces on the cart to determine whether or not the cart's going to accelerate. And similarly, we would only look at the horse to determine whether or not the horse is going to accelerate. And so that's the answer to the paradox. Yes, the forces are equal and opposite, but they act on different things. And so if you want to know if something's going to accelerate, you look at the forces on that thing only. And then you can tell if it's going to accelerate. And we have, I've taken from your textbook, one of these uh, check your understanding checkpoints. And uh, a couple of questions here. Number one, on a cold rainy day, your car battery is dead, so you must push the car to move it to get it started. Why can't you move the car by remaining inside the car? Why do you have to get outside the car? Well, if you're inside the car... It's like you're part of the car, right? So you are pushing against the car and the car is pushing back against you. In that case, because you're effectively part of the car, the forces would cancel. But if you're outside the car pushing on the car, then you're not part of the car. So you're pushing on the car and the car is pushing back on you and the two of you are acting like separate objects. So that's why you have to get outside the car to push it. You can't push it from within. Now the second question here is, does a fast moving baseball possess a force? And the answer to that, hopefully you know, without even thinking about it too much, has gotta be no. We know that force is not needed to keep something moving. We talked about that all the way back when we were talking about Aristotle and the arrow, that once things are moving, their inertia will keep them moving with whatever velocity they have. A force is necessary to change the motion, not keep the motion. Now, with that said, if the baseball hits something, it can deliver a force to whatever it hits. That's a different question altogether. But the baseball itself doesn't have force as some you know, built-in property, like it has mass as a built-in property. Force is something that has to be applied to the baseball or something that the baseball is going to apply to something else.